Well, I think I made that in it was probably 1990 something or other. Um, it was a it, it's it, it's a it's a funny film. Well, it you know it's, it's supposed to be a comedy and all that sort of stuff. And it, I think it's a film that has it's trying to say too much. It's it's got too many um, agendas in a strange way. So it's. Um, I, I like much simpler films now, with you know one one track thought and all that sort of stuff. Anyway. Well, I personally <laughs> loved it because, uh, you know, a lot of white people who don't know Aboriginal people, and that's especially the case here in Melbourne. You know, um, don't get it that a person like you, for instance, or me or Tracy, we inhabit a world where. Um, Aboriginal people hold, you know, the other world, mm -hmm. the Mimi world, the Mokoi world, to be, you know, true and out there and part of the world we live in. Mm -hmm. And they, uh, <clears throat> they expect us, when we're with them, to uh, behave in a, the way that, you know, is traditional in their world or, uh, you know, customary in their world. Yeah. And, you know, speak to the spirits and don't go over there and, and that, you know, follow all the rules. And, and I, I thought it was just terrific that an artist could come along and kind of, you know, make fun of our world. Yeah. It hadn't Which, really yeah. happened before. I don't think anybody had ever been game, you know, to put a, a McCoy or a Mimi in a, in a movie and uh, turn it into a comedy. Yeah. Because everybody was so ooh about you know, the spirit yeah, world. Yeah, so it, it was interesting getting permission of um, uh, the young ones to use the Mimi. They sort of, they, um, they laugh their heads off. Because um, we, we had the script and we, we uh, Rachel Perkins and I acted out, you know, in this small outstation, acted out the whole script and she was playing Sophie and I was playing Aaron Patterson to these old men and they're like, whoa, laughing their heads off. I was like, well, that's obviously some form of, you know, Permission, but they were telling us that they'd, they'd come down to Sydney for because um, they're famous artists. One of them, being the artist who created the Mimi for us, um, said that once he'd come down for an exhibition in Sydney and seen a Mimi driving a taxi. So you know, it, it's sort of like yeah, this happens all the time. Yeah. You know? yeah. <laughs> Mimi's go on, you know, Mimi's go on holidays and do things. So. Yeah. Why wouldn't you find one in the fridge? Yeah. 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 <laughs> exactly. uh, uh, God, what did I do with my Mimi? I must have left it in the fridge. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, and so you didn't. Did you get any flack from other Aboriginal people about, <clears throat> you know, making this film? No, Just, not, You know, like down south or something. No, not really. I, you know, I've, 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 you know, no, I'm, I'm a big boy. People kind of don't come up to me and growl me about <laughs> about things. But um, I, I did hear some rumours that there were certain people that didn't like, it. and that's cool. You know what I mean? That's that's the beauty of being a human. So you know. Um, but not not really, yeah. You know, it's sort of it is. You know, obviously, if I was an Aboriginal, it'd be a lot of flack in, in a strange kind of way. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. But yeah. because where I come from and and who I am and and you know the the stuff that I make is kind of like this. I, I, I there, there's no there's no boundaries in my kind of filmmaking about. Um, being PC in a sense, you know what I mean? There, you know, there's certain things that are secret and sacred where I would never go, but um, I, I like to take, um, I like to turn the camera around back on us just as much as I turn it on anybody else. Um, <clears throat> well, that, uh, you know, sense of humour that you have and that eye for, for detail in the Aboriginal world um, comes from, obviously, you know, where you grew up. You grew up in Alice Springs. Yeah, a re yeah, you know, a really bohemian lifestyle of, of, um, of cinema and radio and, and documentary and artists. You know, I, I spent a fair bit of time back and for forward from Alice Springs to Utopia, way back when you know all the all the old ladies were um, doing um, Utopia at the Bartiks, and then you know I, I still remember Emily when she, she first started painting, painting on our veranda. You know, sort of having a respite from family and she's coming to town and paint on our veranda and that sort of stuff. And you need know, to have filmmakers coming in into our household every second weekend and that sort of stuff. So you had a really, a really, you know, an amazing, I had a very amazing upbringing in with, with these sort of people 
coming and going, and you know, and seeing, uh, you know, seeing all of Trace, you know, being like 17 and seeing um, Night Cries and seeing Mike Riley's works and all that sort of stuff, and being incredibly inspired straight away that as an Indigenous storyteller, you can, you know, that these people are doing this stuff, and you'd never seen it before. You'd never seen any Indigenous stuff from anybody, bar dots and and bar teak in a sense. And suddenly, cinema and photography was being, you know, was being. Um, Sort of at its at, at its sort of early creation by you know by Tracy and Michael and that and a lot of other artists as well and it was just being completely blown away you know and having having access to their images and that very very early in my life. So there you are. You're at the convergence of you know the the Aboriginal art movement, which is just starting to take off in the 80s. <laughs> the Namajira traditions. Your mother's set up Karma and Impaja. Um, there's Aboriginal television, which has got a footprint across Australia for the first time in history. There's Aboriginal television being made. I think the program in Arundel was called Anurunakona. Can you yeah, remember that? Yeah, yeah, ours. Yeah. Ours, yeah, yeah. Anurunakona, yeah. yeah. And, um, and, you know, various other, lots of other Aboriginal television. And as you say, filmmakers coming to town. Um, who made Green Ant Dreaming? Uh, what, yeah, one of Hurt Song. Yeah. Hurt, Hurt Song. Herzog, yeah. yeah. Herzog, I remember Herzog coming to Alice Springs. Yeah, and I, I met him and, yeah. and Wim Vendors, you know. Wim Vendors, you, you yeah. Know, they're all, you know, yeah. come around our place for a barbecue all the time, you know. So, yeah. <laughs> well, no, but it's true. And, you know, yeah. everybody from around the planet would drop into Alice Springs. Um, star of Dr. Zavago. Julie Christie. Julie Christie dropped into my backyard. She probably went around to your place as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, so it was like that all the time, wasn't yeah, it? And you know, like Karma's, Karma's first donation, Karma, the Central Australian Aboriginal Media Association, our, our first donation was from Eartha Kitt, where she gave us $1,000 in like 1983 when she popped through Alice Springs. You know, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you sort of, so yeah, a really beautiful collective of, of, of people in a sense. And you kind of, at that time, you, I, I didn't really, you know, you don't really care. You're a teenager with a fringe and you just want to hide behind it, you know, and, but, there, there came that point where it was sort of like, well, what are you going to do, Warwick? And I couldn't kick a football, and the only way to get out of Alice Springs was to be drafted in the AFL, in a sense, you know. So, and I, was, you know, I couldn't catch or kick. So it was like, well, you know, that was it was sort of like, you know, the, a gorgeous sort of upbringing in a sense that sort of translated into, oh well, I want to tell stories as well. And you first became a cinematographer, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and so from a pretty young age, you're studying, you're carrying a camera. 17, yeah. 17, yeah. which kind of accounts for the feeling in your films that, you know, with your cinematography, that the camera is almost part of your body. And yet I get a real sense of that in the doco made by Beck Cole, your wife. Yeah. Uh, the making of Samson and Delilah, with you scooting along the ground with a huge camera on your shoulder getting yeah. right in people's faces. So tell us about, you know, your first camera and your first training and all that. It was funny, it was, you remember Vincent Forrester? He yeah, used yeah. to be the head of um, the, the, at Karma. Um, he, he was the head of, we got, we got a whole lot of money off um, DEET or someone like that there. And it, was a, it was a fortune, it was like a million dollars or something, part of the bicentenary um, money. And um, which, you know, people didn't like that we'd taken bicentenary money, but you know, there's a lot of great people out there like me and Rachel who, who studied through that kind of money and it made a big difference to who we are now. But um, he, 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 he was sort of like, he, he went to Vietnam for five minutes or something like that there during the, during the, you know, the late 60s and that. And he would always say to me, check your weapon. And, but referring to a, the camera as a weapon, he said, that there fights racism, that's a gun against racism, that camera, so you keep the lens clean, you keep, you know, like he's talking about an M16 machine gun in a sense, you know, clean your gun so it works properly. And that was kind of the, the, the sort of upbringing as a, as a trainee that I had, was, you know, you, and you were thrusted straight into the idea of, well, start making stuff, you know, here's the camera, here's an edit suite, start doing something for your people in a sense. And we started making those little ads, the little community service ads. That Tell you us about one of those ads. I love those. Yeah, well, you know, they were sort of, um, you know, just um, shower block, you know, wash behind your ears kind of ads and eat good food and, and you know, um, I, made, I, I made an ad once and I just sort of come up with the idea and, and, um, and um, 
decided I'll just go, go home and, and, and make it. And I, I made it with my brother and it was just a silhouette of my brother drinking a, you know, a, a carton of beer. And um, so it's sort of, uh, so the background's white and he's, he's a black silhouette. And then he, he drinks beer and he throws his arms around and he, you know, get, he, he, he gets really, really drunk and then fo and sort of basically lies over and, and sort of passes out. And then it, and right at the end, I just sort of wrote this tagline saying, it's black and white, alcohol kills, you know, that, you know, something that simple that you could just, act, you had access to cameras. And it was that, broadcast on television. Yeah, and then, and then, you know, and then cut it the next day and then suddenly it's on in Parja. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? For the yeah. next five years, you yeah. know, this one little ad, you know. So, you How know, old were you when you were making these ads? 17, 17 18, yeah. yeah. So you're being broadcast at 17 yeah. with basically, you know, homemade videos, right? Yeah, yeah, basically, yeah. Yeah, yeah and having not, not really any idea how to do it properly, but just having lots of ideas. And, you, ha you know, you could... You could do something and it would actually happen, which was a really beautiful thing. And so you go to AFTRS, Australian Film, Television and Radio School at Macquarie University in North Sydney. How old were you then? Uh, I, I, I was a cameraman for Karma for around about, uh, for about four years. And I was doing a lot of documentaries and a lot of ads and really never doing drama. You know, and, and seeing Tracy's work and, you know, with Bedeviled and all that kind of stuff, I just really felt that it, uh, that was the next step is to, to get a, a really strong background in drama and in camera, you know, in film cameras, because I, I was shooting a lot of video. It was all video. There was no f such thing as film for us, you know, financially, you just couldn't afford it. So I decided to take that great leap and, and go and get a Bachelor of Arts in, in cinematography. Went to the film school for three years and, and and I had an absolute ball, just completely had the best time, just playing and, and having no real responsibilities, just, just learning the craft and, and breaking all the rules in a sense. Just, let's just go back one step. When you were 17 and making the ads for Imparja, was Imparja out at Little Sisters Camp? Was that where it was located? Well, Karma, Karma was at Little Sisters, and yeah. that's where we would make the, the ads. Yeah. That's right, yeah. yeah okay. Basically, yeah. Okay, so give the audience a picture of Little Sisters Camp and how Karma, you know, this hand built building, yeah. built by, you know, Rodney Gooch, Robbie Cole, me, you yeah. know, yeah. you know, all it was, it, sitting in the middle of Little Sisters Camp. Give it, everybody it, a picture it, of that. It, 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 was totally, it was total frontline. You went to work where you know, tragedy and travesty would happen every day. We, you know, you'd go to work in the morning and there would be people dead on the, on the doorstep who'd been knocking on the door to call an ambulance because they'd been stabbed that night. And um, obviously, you know, no one was at Karma at the time, so they'd just died on the, on the, on the, on the steps. And then you play, you, you, you've seen that every single day. You've seen the, the absolute tragedy, but you've seen the absolute beauty of a, of a you know, a, um, you know, one of those, one of the, t the town camps. So, you know, and that, you, that's the stuff that you draw it upon to make your ads and you, you draw it upon to you make a change and trying to create a better place through education, you know, of, of, of people through ads or through radio, through music, creating diversionary things for kids where we'd have, you know, concerts and that at the, at the place, you know, with, if, you know, especially on Thursday nights when, when um, you know the, the pe people would get their pension, the, the 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 camp would get really really rough and bad. So we'd make sure that that night we'd we'd stay, we'd have people stay there that night, and we'd put a concert on with no alcohol or anything to make sure that you know families could have a respite from the community that was which was getting a bit wild at the time. So yeah, yeah, you grew up with that sort of stuff, and it it, it really did reinforce every day you know how important what you were doing was. So you get to Afters in North Sydney. Um, you've worked for four years as a cinematographer, working out of the Karma building in Little Sisters Camp, south of Alice Springs, just under the range. You've seen, you know, countrymen dead on the, the doorstep when you go to work in the morning. And here you are in Sydney mm. and you get to be a at student at university. At a university, university, and you get to be a student. And it's like, hey, this is you know what I mean. This sort of, the you know, it's kind of it, 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 you, that you know what happened at Karma. You know, can wear you down. It, you know, that stuff wears down anybody. And, and 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 I really did 
break free from, you know, I'm always Aboriginal, I'm a, I'm a filmmaker, I'm Aboriginal first, I'm a filmmaker second, I can go and become a plumber tomorrow if I want, you know what I mean, we can do whatever we want, we're always going to be, so. yeah, no, no, <laughs> but you, you know, you're, you, so, but I really enjoyed film school because it, it, I, I could, I was making films that had nothing to do with Aboriginal people in a sense, you know what I mean, I had my own di ideas, I actually didn't want to make films about my people as part of being at film school. I actually wanted to witness and feel a, a broader um, sort of world of cinema in a sense. So I had lots of ideas but I was sort of holding them back under my sleeve um, so that when I got out of film school I could, you know, I can, I can do the stories that I really wanted to make because I found that the, the school was such a beautiful and, 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 and dynamic place but they, you know, if I was to get one of my stories, you know, there'd be a lot of people who would put their fingers in that pie and and play with it in a sense, you know. And no, no, tell us what you mean. Well, you know, sort of, you, you, you want to make a, a really important story for yourself, but then suddenly you've got all these teachers. And it's kind of, for me personally, it was, they they had a lot of impressions on, on me and, and to, 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 and they could, they could shape and move and, you know, send you in, in different directions and I, don't, I didn't think that those films were right for them to be able to have that kind of uh, access to. You know, you know, I wanted to write films afterwards and those films were very personal films so I didn't want you know, heads of departments telling me how to make this film okay. in a sense. But I did want to learn the craft and I, did want to, and I wanted to be completely knowledgeable what, for when I left and I did so that I could make those films that I wanted to make. Okay, so you're a good cinematographer from an early age. You also are familiar with a whole lot of films, filmmakers, um, radical filmmakers, conceptual filmmakers. You probably saw as much kung fu and cowboy films as the rest of us, right? Yeah. So as you're thinking about the film you want to make when you finish school, who's your big influence? Who are the filmmakers, the directors, the films that influence you? Um, you know, there was a stage when it was sort of a, a much more sort of European kind of idea of cinema. Because, <clears throat> you know, a lot, of, a lot of storytelling, you know, has been, has been done before. And, you know, you, you, when you make a film, you're generally re referencing, you know, a hundred other films that have been made. Um, but, you know, I, I, I spent, I, really fortunate, after, kind of when I, my last year of film school, when I was kind of just waning a bit about this, this is all getting a bit too long in the tooth. Um, <clears throat> Michael Riley came along and basically took me under his wing and I started loading film for, for him and started shooting, you know, smaller, smaller projects with him. And, you know, he, um, he, he just really opened my mind to, to, um, to you know, a, a visual feast of, you know, of Indigenous storytelling because I'd, I'd, I'd learned a lot of commercial stuff and I wanted to be a commercial cinematographer, you know, and, and do that great Hollywood film and all that kind of stuff. And, um, but, but working with him, they were smaller projects and they were much more dynamic and the storytelling was much more truthful to where I'd come from and what I, I, I felt. And so, you know, he became really important to me. Um, you know, some of the, you know, more, more, on the, more on the basis of you can do whatever you want rather than I just want to, you know, do what Michael does in a sense. And, you know, and Tracy's um, Bedevil came along and, and, and completely blew my mind at the Sydney Film Festival. I think it was ninety six, seven, something like that. There and and you know and that and and it, and it really did put me back on track because coming out of the film school, you really I felt I wanted to be that sort of successful commercial film uh, cinematographer, and uh, they you know watching their works and, and and working with Michael really put me back on track about well you know you you actually you have stories to tell and you have things to say and they're very personal things to do with your family and your people. And this is actually, this is kind of a calling in a sense and you should respect that idea and you should, um, you know, if you, 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 you can get this stuff right. You don't have to go off and make Jaws 3 or anything like that there, you know. <laughs> so basically, for those who don't know, Michael Riley is, you know, now deceased but mm -hmm. uh, in the last decade of his life perhaps he were, he became a very well known Aboriginal artist and his work is still shown internationally yeah. so long after his passing. Yeah. 
And so uh, he uh, worked with uh, photographic image. He also made documentaries. Didn't he make a documentary about an, uh, an Arnhem Land artist? Yeah, I think so. The, you know, the most, the big, the, the really empowering one that he did was one called Empire. Empire. Yeah, with, with the, well, um, where he had, um, and he did that as part of, I think it was part of the Bicentenary, or one of those yeah. things, or no, some Olympic or something like that there, you know. And uh, it's a really incredibly beautiful piece there. So your mentor is, is an Aboriginal visual artist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And you know, the, you know, just... You, you, when you from come, New South Wales. From New South Wales. When you come from a world, when you come from a world where, um, you know, the first images you're seeing are, 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 are dot paintings, you know, that, that you, you're recognising, and that you know, you've got your Namanjuras, but the first, and the Namanjuras, you know, are beautiful stories in, in their own right, but the real storytelling is coming from a, a, a painting that's a, a succession of dots and, and, and maybe some some centric circles or half circles and you know and sort of crescent moony kind of things and then the artist says that's about you know seven women who were chased by this you know this um this magic crazy old man and they went underground and then they went up into the sky and then they turned into the milky way and you're looking at something that just has for you personally no reference you know you just cannot see seven women and you can't see this you know this crazy old magic man, you know, Wati Nuru and all that kind of stuff. And then you just go, okay, believe, you know what I mean? And that's what that artist has painted. And when you grow up looking at stuff like that there, you kind of, the, it opens your mind to, you know, storytelling and, and visual arts in a sense that don't have to be purely referenced to you know, a, a, a strict form of documentary or a strict form of photography or anything. It's, it's such a beautiful way to, to think, you know. It, and it is about the story is so powerful. And the image is incredibly amazing as well. And, I, you know, it's, it's, it's a nice way to grow up. Yeah. So, <clears throat> what's your first film that you yourself directed? Uh, a film called Payback. Payback. Yeah, a black yep. and white film um, with... Um, George Warumbu, who's, who's, who's uh, deceased now, who uh, is the lead singer of Warumpi Band. And it's about him getting out of jail and um, uh, you know, spending 30 years in jail. And then basically when he gets out, he still has to go through traditional payback, you know, that sort of the completion of you know, two different laws and, and all that sort of stuff. So I, and I, made that, I made that just after getting out of film school. Yeah. yeah. And that would be sort of like your, you know, uh, young man grows up story, yeah? yeah? The artist as a young man story. Because, you know, you got yourself out of Alice Springs, you've, you've seen, you know, payback in, in, in you know, Little yeah. Sisters Camp yeah. and, you yeah. know, out in the bush. Um, it, it underwrites everything going on in Aboriginal society in Central Australia. There's always payback. Yeah. So whereas, you know, the story for, a young white man might be, you know, his first sexual experience in the back of the car. For you, it's payback. Yeah, yeah. That's your first yeah. story. And then, yeah. You know, they sort of, it, 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 yeah, absolutely. It kind of, you know, just sort of looking at that sort of, that transition of 40 years in, you know, 30 years in jail and then sort of like 30 minutes worth of payback and how does that translate? As well as it kind of, at the same time, 60 minutes, which was incredibly big, you know, in the, um, in the early 90s was um, did a did a uh, one of the um, you know bad investigative journalism things about a payback that happened at Papunya I know Unamu sorry and I kind of it was just sort of like I just wanted to vent my personal kind of questions and opinion in a, in a short film in a sense and it's very much a young man's concern because here we are right now and Liam Jarrah's up on charges for, you know, being involved in the payback incident in Alice Springs and, yeah. you know, his career in football's over. So it's yeah. perennially the young man's, you know, yeah, trouble. Yeah. I mean, you know, black kids in Los Angeles have, or, or you know, yeah. Hispanics have the problem with the gangs. Aboriginal kids from Alice Springs have the problem with the payback, yeah? Yeah, yeah, but, and, but, yeah absolutely. And that kind of, you know, you know there is that sort of... There is all these things about law and initiation and becoming, having to do things 
for, you know, when you become part of that club in a sense, having responsibilities and when someone says you have to do that, you do have to do that. You know yep. what I mean? And so, you know, they sort of work dynamically the same, you know, sort of, it's a hard one, that stuff, and how you talk about it and how you think about it. And, you know, so, you know, that's kind of what payback's about. Let's move on then to you being the cinematographer on Rachel Perkins, uh, first uh, feature film, Radiance, yeah. where you're working with an all-female cast, yeah. very much a women's story, yeah. in North Queensland, in the sugarcane fields. Yeah. How does that feel? Yeah, it was, it, you know, it, it was, I was 26 when I shot that film for, for Rachel, and the first feature film, um, you know, um, a massive amount of pressure because, you know, I've only done shorts before that. Um, it was great work working with them. You know, sort of Rachel, Rachel and I held hands through that film because we really, you know, it was the first time she'd directed. She'd actually never made a short film before that. She'd actually went straight to, to Radiance, you know. She'd, she'd made, you know, documentaries with me and ads with me at Karma in the early days and that, but she'd never actually done that transition of doing short films and then making a, a feature film. She, you know, typical bloody Perkins, she just goes straight to the feature, you know. And um, and it was it was it was it was it was a really beautiful experience in a sense. And you know we had Rachel Mazza and Deb Mailman and Patricia Morton Thomas, um, who you know were an amazing cast. It was a Louis Now script, which was you know we we love well we kind of Louis Louis Louis, Louis you know and um, it kind of um, it it just really it really really gelled for us. You know it, we had we had such a great great time. You know. It, they were, they were fantastic. Everybody looked after me, and said the whole crew did, you know. And you know, it was a big, it was a big thing. You know, it was, it was Tracy had already done Bedevilled, and um, it was kind of that that next stepping stone of, of um, Indigenous films in a sense, you know, feature films. Yeah. So I think Tracy's film is the first Aboriginal feature film. Is that right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. Bedevilled's the first feature it film. The second be, one yeah. is Rachel Perkins' Radiance. Yeah. 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 Okay. So. <clears throat> Tell us when you started to think about Samson and Delilah, because again, you know, like you do it, you're working on a lot of films. Tell us something about yeah. it, about that. Yeah. And then you return to your roots. Yeah. You tell the big Alice Springs Central Desert story. Yeah. That's obviously been brewing away in the back of your mind for a long time. Yeah, you know that that kind of you have that opportunity. You've got two opportunities after you've done a lot of short films and everybody's got money for you. They've all got money for me to make this film, and the, but they, nobody knows what it is, and I kind of don't know what it is. And I kind of it's it, it's kind of like, well, what do you do? Do you make you try and make something that is like massively commercial, um, very sort of contain, uh, very um, very basic and that sort of stuff. Um, or do you go out on a limb and make something that's really important? You know, and that's kind of not the kind of films that are important to me. That that kind of that kind of cinema, you know, um, the money making kind of idea of cinema. And you know, the intervention. I'd written the film before the the, the intervention had hap started and, and all that kind of stuff. And um, I wanted to make a film that really sort of because um, even the petrol sniffers, are, are, it's the they're um, they're really they they're kind of the Walking Dead in a sense, and they they really you know the the elders go oh their heads are broken they they're no good now you can't you can't help them anymore which is kind of wrong in a sense you know, and then and in the, in the and in the Alice Springs they're kind of like this feared thing because they're so um, well they can be quite dangerous they're not, not generally not but they can be quite dangerous and I just wanted to make a film to humanize these kids who have obviously, you know, you ask, well, why are they sniffing? You know what I mean? Let's go back to the sort, you know, go right back to what, why is this all happening rather than just um, they are sniffers, their heads are broken and they're kind of completely written off. So I just wanted to make this beautiful love story about these two petrol sniffers in a sense. And it was kind of like, it was an idea and I'd written it and, I, and then I went off and wrote another big feature and then suddenly Screen Australia was doing this transition to, um, um, they had all this money they had to get rid of, <laughs> ironically, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, it was because of the financial years and all that kind of beautiful stuff. And um, they, they said, shit, we've got a million dollars. 
what's Warwick doing? Can he make a film for, what, for a million dollars? And I said, and, and someone rang me and I said, yeah, I can make a film for a million dollars, and here it is, you know? And, and it was kind of like that. When you write films, you write, you write, you write different size budget films, and you have the million dollar film, you have the five million dollar hit film, and then you have the fifty million dollar film. And depending, it's kind of like, they're like aces up your sleeve. You know what I mean? You kind of like all, you know, you, 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 you align yourself to how much money is around rather than um, trying to find too much money or any of that sort of stuff. So if there's a million bucks around, you go, oh, here's, here's one I prepared earlier, you know, that kind of thing. And let's go and make that there. Or if there's 25 million, you pull that one out and you go, oh, that's, that's, you know, so. <laughs> so um, and you know, it, it was. It, I, I wanted to make a film uh, that not not only was incredibly important to me, but kind of helped. And then, you know, this is being a bit, bit of a um, uh, this is this is for my ego, but would help um, universally with my career in a sense. I, you know what I mean? The, the, a film that was sort of uh, artistic, autistic. You know what I mean? Or you know, it kind of that that did show that I'm very good at my craft, in a, in a sense. It had to do that there because it was my first feature. But I, was, I had to make a film that was incredibly personal and important to me. So those two things aligned by writing that one film. Okay, let's go to the story about the two petrol sniffers and how it's received by the audience. Now, I have no idea what the audience at Khan thought, mm -hmm. although, you know, you got the standing ovation and lots of media coverage and everything. Yep. But I remember uh, watching Margaret Pomerantz and what's his name, talking about yep. your film, and she said, it's such a wonderful story of hope. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, we've been watching a different film. Um, so I don't think the Australian urban audience got it that the story is about two petrol sniffers and, you know, tell me if I'm wrong, but at the end they're not going off to, you know, yeah. you know, well, they're not heaven and well-being in the outstation. They're actually going to die and, you know, yeah. it's actually an incredibly depressing ending. But at the same time, yes, there's the whole good news story. They are human beings. They're just kids. We shouldn't treat them like, you know, but zombies and exclude them. But I don't think the Australian audience got it, do you? Well, the, the, the irony is of that film is just being alive yep. is uh, um, a happy ending. You, know? yep. you know what I mean? That's mm, well, all I yeah. want. You know what I mean? Tomorrow's another day. Tomorrow could turn into anything. But they were there and they were sort of safe and alive. And how tragic is that, that, you know what I mean, that that could be an, a, a good outlook for an Indigenous person in Central Australia. That's my, that was my, my take on it. Um, and, you know, that's just sort of like, that's just basic human rights in a, in a really weird way. But for, you know, people who are calling it a, um, um, a happy ending, well, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's sad that you think that way, but that's the truth. It, you know, and that's kind of, that's what I wanted, you know. Um, you know, they weren't going to click their heels and be back in Kansas, you know. It, it, it just ain't going to happen that way. And that was really important, that they were alive and safe, but tomorrow's another day and anything could happen. And, you know, and not give them a, a, a clear-cut outline of what the future's going to be because I wanted an audience to worry about tomorrow for them because tomorrow is tomorrow. So if you watch it today, even though it was made ten years ago or what it, five years ago, see, tomorrow's you're worrying again, and that's the way we should think about Indigenous issues. It's just like, you can't solve them. They're always going to be uh, um, tomorrow. Now, I was in Europe and England at the time, and I remember the, they went nuts about it. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody knew anything about um, the Aboriginal world, Australian cinema, art cinema, wanted to see this film. It was big news in Europe. I don't know what happened in Australia mm -hmm. um, at that particular moment, but did you expect to win the camera door and to get the response that you got to that film? No, no. Because it was yeah. highly financially successful as well, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, it made, it made all its money back and a shitload more, you know what I mean? It, it kind of, which it, for an Australian film, for it to actually make its budget is like a, you know, it's a, it's a, a very, Amazing thing, you know, so many. Did it come uh, before or after Brand New Day? Uh, before. 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 So it was, in fact, the first financially successful Indigenous film, wasn't it? Australian yeah, Indigenous uh, film. Tracy might have made no. more. No. <laughs> no. Tell us about the sapphires, because uh, there's all sorts. It's interesting. I did, a, I, did a, I did an interview this morning with a, a guy who's writing a, um, 
a big book on cinematography, world cinematography. And uh, he interviewed me, and he, he talked about the, you know, the iconic moments in um, Samson and Delilah, yeah, him dancing, her watching, you know, and you know, all, all these different things. And he was talking about that. And he asked me, do you, do, do you think that, there's, uh, that there will be any iconic moments in Sapphires? And I said, no, not really. But they're different films, and you design films differently. Sapphires, right from the, the word S, was designed to be a public, um, to, 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 to be successful, to make money, to, to transcend all genders and um, cultures and languages. It was completely designed to be uh, a, a box office success. Whereas Samson Delilah, we kept that film so under the radar I don't even think the funding bodies realised they paid for it. That's how that no one knew that this film was being made until we'd finished it. Because we we really loved the film. I really loved the film when I when I finished it. But I wasn't sure if I was blowing smoke up my own ass and being completely autistically groovy. And you know what I mean? A film about two kids who don't speak and they sniff petrol and you know it's got all these wacky camera shots in it and that sort of stuff. And it just wasn't you know. We hadn't had a, a quite a good success rate for Indigenous films uh, financially. Uh, uh, the, the country had really not gone, to, you know, we don't want to see, there, there, there'd been a, a last four years before that of we're sick of depressing Australian films was, you know, generally what was in the papers. And that's kind of truthful, you know, and so we were kind of on the back foot going, you know, shit, we just spent a million dollars of taxpayers' money and we weren't we were afraid that, you know, we were just going to go down that gurgler again. But Australia at that point, and it, the, the, the horrific thing is that it came out six months after the intervention, even though we'd shot it before the intervention, Australia wasn't getting the information that they needed from our newspapers. Our newspapers were just writing crap about the intervention. And it was... Uh, and whether whoever owned the, um, the newspaper dictated what side they were, um, they were portraying in the, in, in, the, in the news. And I think Australia got really confused about what the hell is going on in Alice Springs? Where's, where's all the background information? And then suddenly this film was released and people went, right, this film actually at least gives us some information that we, you know, that we haven't had before. It, it's op it opened a door to a place where we'd never had access before to, and people were hungry to, to find out what they, you know, and I think that's how it worked. It, the Australia did embrace it. Less of a, you know, going to the cinemas to escape your lives, like you would with a, with a musical or, or an action block off box office thing, but more so that they were just needed to find out more about their own people and, and, you know, the Aboriginal people, you know, they needed to get better educated and better informed and there was this film that was floating around that could help. It didn't, ha it do didn't have the, all the answers, it doesn't have any answers really, but it at least helped inform people about what was happening in the Northern Territory or a background and that kind of worked in our favour. Whereas something like the Sapphires, you know, you know the, the Sapphires, just the budget to advertise it would be more, would, would be more than what it cost us to make the whole whole Samson and Delilah film. You know, it's designed to be to make money and to play a, a, a much different a much different audience and a, mu mu a very different world in a sense. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, you're you're the director and the cinematographer on Samson and Delilah, and you've got a crew of how many? Uh, there's about six, seven of us. Six or seven, and. Uh, <clears throat> A tight little team, mm -hmm. it flies under the radar. You didn't expect it to be successful, but here you are working on Radiance with Wayne Blair and presumably a huge crew. No, oh, Sapphires, yeah. I mean, sorry, the Sapphires. Yeah, 60, you, 60 in the crew, you know, that okay. kind of different. Yeah, 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 so 10 times the crew. Yeah. And you're working with Wayne Blair, so you are not the director. No, yeah. But obviously he's relying on you big time to get the picture yeah, right. Well, it's yeah, it's his first feature, so, you know. Yeah. And he's got, he's, he's got he, he has, a, if you see Wayne's short films, they do have a very commercial, um, um, context to them in a sense. They're, qu they're, they're quite palatable. He's a great actor as well. So, so Wayne Blair is an Indigenous ex-footballer 
actor, filmmaker. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. he's the director of Sapphire. the Sapphires. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And and um, it was very. I was, I was just really fortunate that he he thought that he, I would be the best person to back him up in that sense. You know, to make that film because. You know, he could have, he, with that script, that, you know, he could have chosen any DP in the world, they would have went and shot that film for him. You know, but he said, no, look, I'll get you to do it, and, you know, we'll hold hands through this whole film. Because, you know, it was a monster. It had, you know, we'd have like 150 extras on, you know, in every day of, you know, GIs, and we had helicopters, and we had machine guns and tanks, and, you know, and in, in, in right in the middle of it, these four girls singing, you know, so it was kind of a, it was a, it was a it was one of those big Hollywood monsters in a sense. And How many cameras? Two. We had two cameras. Really? Yeah, every day on every shot. So right. yeah. Wayne came up to me and said, "Brother, it's up to me and you, isn't it?" Everybody's just looking at us, going, "What are we doing?" I'm like, "Yeah, that's how this this stuff works." Because <laughs> he'd done all these shorts and that, but he just realised that there was you know 60 crew and they're all just turned around and there's just me and Wayne, these two bloody black fellas, you know. And they, and they all just look at us going, well, what are we doing? And it's sort of like, right, well, you bring the potato salad, you bring the watermelon, and let's have, you know what I mean? And it's kind of, it was, it was really empowering, you know, and to do a, a big film like that, that, you know, that, you know, it's, it's pulled $15 million um, in the last six weeks, bought by the Weinsteins for $6 million, they'll make $50 million in America, it's going to work, you know what I mean? But for, for you know, these two, these two blokes who kind of, you know, have made, have made a living out of, out of out of doing that sort of really sort of nurturing indigenous kind of cinema, then suddenly trying to play that big Spielberg blockbuster kind of idea, and then and and it working was just absolutely fantastic. You know, to be able to, because you just never know if you can really do it. You know, and can you cut it in a place like Hollywood? We didn't have to go there to make the film, but it seems like it's going to work, and that's kind of. It's a really beautiful thing, you know, and it's still an it's an Aboriginal story about you know three sisters and, and a cousin, and that's that's really special. That's because sort of, you do you you know you don't want to sit under a tree all your life, you know. We all, you know, we don't all want Ferraris, but we don't want to sit under trees and. I want Ferraris. <laughs> 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 but being able, you know. Ideally. <laughs> being able to be, being able to cut it in that world, that that you know, ruthless world, yeah. being able to actually do it is is is, is quite special. Yeah. We can we can do it. Yeah.